1957, the US government launched a highly classified and enormously expensive Cold War project to build a nuclear weapon that was to be superior to any that had come before it. Its terrifying capabilities threatened to unleash both physical and psychological destruction in the Soviet Union. Codenamed Project Pluto, the program dared to imagine a nuclear-powered cruise missile that would roar at over 150 decibels, nearly as loud as a space launch, just above the treetops at supersonic speeds. The shockwave alone would cause immense damage on the ground, yet it would also be equipped to carry 16 or more hydrogen bombs as it flew over enemy territory, spewing atomic exhaust particles out of its unshielded reactor. It would be called the Supersonic Low Altitude Missile, or SLAM, an acronym that some believed should have stood for slow, low, and messy. Project Pluto. The bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki changed the world forever, introducing humanity to the very real threat that any major international altercation could become the last. With the USSR launching Sputnik, the world's first satellite that same year, the US worried that the Soviets would win the space and missile races. The United States needed ambitious projects to counter both the perception of Soviet excellence and the threat the other superpower posed. In addition to the strategic bomber and intercontinental ballistic missile arsenals that it developed and continued to build, the U.S. Air Force wanted a third type of weapon capable of delivering nuclear retaliatory strikes against the USSR and other potential hostile actors. Concern over possible Soviet anti-ballistic missiles took hold of American militants and scientists. If the Soviet Union found a way to halt or fully combat U.S. attacks and retaliatory moves, it would pose a tremendous national security risk for the West. The Air Force wanted to build something revolutionary that would give the U.S. the upper hand in almost any situation. To build this new weapon of mass destruction, which the Air Force hoped would be completed and ready for use by 1965, the Air Force and the Atomic Energy Commission selected the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory in Livermore, California on January 1, 1957. The research project, with virtually no known cap on spending or accountability to Congress, was named Project Pluto. The goal was to figure out a way to use nuclear reactors to power a missile that could in turn drop nuclear bombs. An 8 square mile, 21 square kilometer facility was built outside of Livermore, on the southwest basin of the Nevada National Security Site, once the project was underway, costing $1.2 million and boasting 25 miles, 40 kilometers of oil well casing that stored pressurized air used to simulate the flight of the new engine they would come to develop. Around 250 people worked at Livermore on this project, a mission of utmost secrecy and import for the government. For American chemists, physicists, engineers, and other specialists at the time, this was one of the most promising endeavors they could involve themselves with. The staff of the lab was particularly elated, since such an important assignment represented an unrivaled opportunity to serve the nation and apply their knowledge with full freedom for scientific creation. Project Pluto went on from 1957 to 1964, jumping at the boundaries of what was considered possible and bending them, or in the words of Ethan Platt, an engineer assigned to the project, quote, Pluto was pretty close to the limits in all respects. SLAM and its engine the weapon in question, a missile, needed to push the limits of technology. It needed to be nuclear-powered and unmanned. Nothing of that sort had ever been built before by any military on the planet. The way that the team at Livermore chose to approach the challenge was through building a ramjet engine. The concept behind such an engine was rather simple and required no moving parts. After launching a hypothetical vehicle through a more conventional method, the velocity of the air pushed in through the front of the vehicle, known as the ram effect, would then expand by coming into contact with the heat of an unshielded nuclear reactor. The expanded air would provide thrust as it exited through a back nozzle. No engine had ever used nuclear energy to heat air this way. The Project Pluto reactor had to be designed smaller than a commercial one to facilitate flight, but had to be sufficiently sturdy to make the significant trip from wherever it would be stationed to a potential target. In fact, the reactor that was built was among the smallest and lightest ever. The resulting engine could carry a missile at 2,500 miles per hour, supersonic speed, and potentially operate for weeks or even months, able to fly around for a long time before being directed at a target. The main challenges with this type of engine were that ramjets were both difficult to construct and maneuver, and that it required special materials that could resist the extreme heat of the reactor. These high temperatures, reaching around 2,500 degrees Fahrenheit, 1,370 degrees Celsius, would have melted most alloys. So the engineers in charge opted for switching metal components for ceramic pieces produced by a small but growing company by the name of Coors. Today, that company, registered under the name Coors Tech, 
turns an annual revenue of around $820 million. Project Pluto was one of the pursuits that brought the company to prominence. Integrating this new type of engine to an ad hoc missile resulted in the assembly of a new weapon, SLAM, standing for Supersonic Low Altitude Missile. The weapon was also endearingly nicknamed the Big Stick. It was built as a nuclear-powered cruise missile that would circulate at a low altitude, dropping nuclear bombs on multiple selected targets and radiating everything in its path. At three times the speed of sound, and capable of flying almost indefinitely, this instrument of mass destruction could carry more than 16 hydrogen bombs, with some reports calculating a maximum possible of 26. While the bombs were intended as the main feature, and were indeed the most hazardous feature for potential victims, the secondary radiation damage the missile could cause while flying over portions of enemy territory it would not bomb would still be significant. With near-infinite fuel, the missile could spend weeks or months radiating areas without dropping a single bomb. The intention was to have the missile crash into one final target at the end of its mission, increasing its potential for destruction. Technological Challenges and Associated Dangers As a killing machine, Project Pluto's slam was exquisite. Militants and civilians of the target nation could be eradicated through nuclear blasts, radiation sickness, or even simply the shockwave of the missile passing over the area. Furthermore, the sheer noise it produced, up to around 150 decibels, would be deafening to those in its proximity. For reference, the human eardrum bursts at 160. Yet despite the record-breaking nature of Project Pluto, the missile came with a few significant issues for the deploying party. The missile would have to cross territory adjacent to the USSR at a very low altitude, the expelled air of the engine releasing plenty of radioactive material, showering American allies in Western Europe. Certainly this could have serious repercussions if it ever were to happen. Additionally, the technology needed to be tested. SLAM was simply too dangerous of a technological advancement to launch untested. What if things went wrong mid-flight, as can occur with guided missiles? What if the missile went off course and landed in friendly territory? Testing the nuclear reactor of the engine in a lab or on a base would prove particularly challenging, since the unmanned and unshielded device could have catastrophic consequences for the surrounding area should anything go wrong. Testing the missile on the ground would be nearly impossible, as it needed to crash in order to be stopped. Testing it remotely might have even had horrifying consequences. Successful Testing While testing the entire missile would be nearly impossible, the Air Force decided to test different parts of it. The most important aspect to test, due to both novelty and risk involved, was the ramjet engine. A prototype named Troy 2A was built for this purpose. The test engine was placed on a railroad car and brought to life for a few seconds. The required incoming air heated at 1300 degrees Fahrenheit. The heat was so intense that lead bricks used to hold down railcar components literally melted into puddles. Three years later, another test engine, Troy 2C, was used, an improved version that ran for five minutes at full power. It was able to pump out 560 megawatts of heat and almost 19 tons of thrust. This test, impressive in 1964, confirmed the great promise of the nuclear-powered engine. The Pentagon reportedly tested other features of the missile, although it began to question the feasibility and potential damage of such a developed weapon. The most important test, however, a real scenario launch with full use of the nuclear capabilities SLAM had to offer, was still on the table. Testing in Nevada was not an option, as it would place most of Southern California at major risk of radioactive contamination should any missteps take place. Involved parties moved their attention to the prospect of conducting an hours-long test flight, or more, over remote open waters in the Pacific Ocean. It was even planned to have the missiles crashed into the Marianas Trench, allowing the hot nuclear reactors to sink almost seven miles deep. Decommissioning Abandonment of Project As a weapon of massive capabilities, the supersonic low-altitude missile was undeniably impressive. The device, almost pulled out of a technological warfare fantasy, felt to some as a powerful, callous, and unstoppable tool for war. The U.S. Air Force and military complex began to worry that SLAM was too expensive, and that the unintended harm to allies in case of deployment made it unviable. The other two types of bomb delivery crafts, the Intercontinental Ballistic Missile and the Strategic Bomber, were more well-suited for conservation of American national security. Furthermore, Fully integrating SLAM into the U.S. forces as a standby weapon might have incentivized the USSR to build a competing missile. In 1964, the Pentagon opted to shut down Project Pluto, giving weight to how provocative the entire endeavor was as part of the reason for closing the program. Yet the history of weaponry has been marked with the possibility of crafting such a device, that an engineer working on the project, John Benny, remarked that even eight years after the missile's engine was decommissioned, it was still, quote, 
So hot, we could only stand near it for a minute or two. 